So, this is one of a continuing series of technology webinars that WebAge gives. This one is on, you know, some set of important Spring Boot and Spring Cloud features. Now, hopefully you know what Spring is. If not, we'll, we'll kind of actually address that as well, just as a quick little level set. And if you guys want any more, look, we, we've got we've basically got an hour to talk about these things. Maybe look at some docs and some and, and, and code. Um, at the end, we also show you that we've got a couple of the courses coming up where we go into this stuff in detail. Um, but at any point, if somebody has a question, please feel free to ask. And you know, you can talk. You know, if if I were to ask uh, a dozen different uh, spring developers you know what are the important features i would hope we would agree on some of them i don't know that we would agree on all of them everybody would have their own list so this is one list of important features of spring boot and spring cloud and one that we felt could be covered in the time frame so Spring Boot and Spring Cloud as you know, they're, they're all the rage, if you will. Um, microservices are all the rage. Um, Open API. So, where does Spring Boot and Spring Cloud fit into this? What are they? Why are they important? And again, what are some of the key features? So this is our, you know, if you will, rough agenda for today. Um, Cross out a few things so I can see better. There we go. Um, we're going to talk about what is Spring Boot. We're going to talk a little bit v briefly about microservices, auto configuration which in the Spring Boot world is, you know, falls under a general mantra of convention over configuration. Having talked about auto configuration, we'll also talk about the ability to externalize configuration and, and we'll talk about why that's, that might be important. Because at the same time as we're going to have led up to an argument about why everything is self-contained, we're also going to say that, well, if everything is self-contained, you actually need to externalize some things, um, namely configuration and why. And that will lead us into the discussion on Spring Cloud and what are the various key components involved in a in, in spring cloud now i referred to the cloud you can you can get all the technology and deploy it on premises that's not a problem or you could go into pivotal's you know product where they'll sell you you know opportunity in their cloud you've got choices Okay. Finally, we'll talk about two more topics that are just sort of timely. Spring Boot 2.0 just came out. What are some of the big, not everything, what are some of the bigger things about Spring Boot 2.0? And having looked at Spring Boot 2.0, well, we understand that there's, you know, Spring is Java or, or possibly Kotlin on your server. And although we do have, you know, frameworks like Spring, you know, MVC, um, you know, the general trend is towards, you know, rich internet applications. It's towards using 
things like angular or, or you know, or reactive. Um, it's towards having an application running in the JavaScript runtime of your browser that manages all of the interaction with the user and that application running in the browser representing your website UI then uses REST-based APIs to get back to middleware, to get back to information in databases or, in, you know, or invoke behavior, um, right? And just like in the past, we would have talked about the LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. And the LAMP stack as an idea was around for a long time, although it was, you know, for us, typically Linux, Apache, um, could have been MySQL or Mariah, and, and Java, right? Just like Ajax. Many of you, if you've ever worked with, you know, that aspect of web technology, and we use the acronym AJAX, Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Well, that may be the acronym, but we're normally talking about asynchronous JavaScript and JSON, not XML. It just doesn't make it convenient an acronym. Likewise, today's version of the LAMP stack, people refer to the MEAN stack, MEAN or sometimes MERN, so what does that stand for, right? MongoDB Express, and the N is for Node, as in Node.js, and then the letter that changes the from between mean and mern is A for Angular or R for Reactive. And so that's an emerged stack for delivering rich internet applications. Well. What if you don't want to be using, I mean, we lo may love Mongo for what it does, um, or we may not be able to use, maybe we'd still need a relational database, so maybe the M should be MySQL or Mariah or DB2 or Oracle. But the bottom line is, I don't necessarily want to use, I mean, I could use Express and Node, but what about Spring Boot? Why am I changing my technology to go use JavaScript on the server necessarily? Um, I can use Spring Boot and all the things we're going to talk about today as my back end, you know, as my server side interface into my back end technologies and still use Angular as my front end in browser technology app. So we'll talk very briefly about the fact that you can actually do that. You can have your Spring Boot on the back end and Angular on the front end. And that can be your version of a mean stack. Okay, so that these are the things we're going to be covering. And why? So first up, what is Spring Boot? So first off, let's just do a quick level set because look, normally at the beginning of a class, I would do a quick survey. I would go through all the students and ask what your background is, um, you know, how, what, what, what familiarity you have with these technologies, um, you know, specific areas of interest that you want to learn during the week. Um, so I can actually customize a delivery for my audience during a week. But we only have an hour today. If I were to do that with all of you, we'd only have a few minutes left at the end. I mean, we currently have, um, you know, 28, of, 28 people in here, you know, at, at, at a minute apiece. That would run us out to 28 minutes. So, no, we're not going to do that. So, uh, you know, if you're already familiar with Spring, great. And if you're not, you know, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. So, Spring itself, right? Spring itself um, 
emerged as a response to what was perceived, and, and I certainly would have agreed with it, having worked with it all back then, as the developer hostile nature of Java EE. In Java EE versions one and even version two, um, it wasn't that it was a joy to work with, it was that it might have been considered necessary to work with. I needed the security, I needed the availability, I needed the container managed behaviors, I needed container managed persistence, I needed container managed transactional behavior. I was b developing an EJB layer between my servlets providing a UI and some database and I needed all that help from Java EE. Well, Java EE would give it to you, but not at a painless cost. Now, late 1990s, early 2000s, people were working on new ideas as this is out. And one of them was the notion of inversion of control, which could mean various things. I mean, in a Java EE web container, we have inversion of control. Your servlet doesn't open a socket and wait for a request. Your servlet sits there as a passive entity, and when the container gets a request, which it decides is intended for you, it will call you. So we've inverted control. Is the container that manages the components. Likewise, the, another aspect of con, inversion of control is CDI, container dependency injection. Rather than my code when it initializes, creating the various things that it needs or looking them up in JNDI, my code declares the thing that it needs and it is the container's responsibility to create those things and make sure I know about them before the container tries to use me. So rather than my having to establish and create the things I'm dependent on, I simply declare my dependencies and it is the container's responsibility to create and inject those dependencies before it tries to use me. And th those are, so inversion of control and aspect-oriented programming are the two pillars of Spring Framework. So inversion of control talks about Spring will be a container. It will handle requests and call you. It will look at your dependencies and set you up before it calls you. Those are two big things. Aspect-oriented programming is a bit different, but we're just gonna simplify it. I can, I can create reusable features like checking to make sure you are um, an authorized user or performing some sort of logging or implementation of transactional behavior. And the engine for doing that that's used by Spring will actually generate code to weave my portable logic called an aspect into your business behaviors. So you, you, we can say, listen, at runtime, I want those POJOs Whenever somebody tries to use them, I want this information logged. Whatever the request and response is, I want that logged. Before you call that thing, I want to apply a transformation. Whatever, when you use that code, I want transaction managed. Whatever it is, we can describe that and the code will be generated to implement it. And the fact that they have all of this makes Spring Boot possible. Spring Boot takes those ideas and runs with them to the nth degree.
Now, one thing that Spring Boot is typically used for is to provide back-end rest, or at least, as I say, restish. I happen to know rest very, very well, and I am somewhat of a rest purist. So there, I, I will say to you that probably 80% of all the things I come across on the internet, including published examples, etc., are actually wrong with respect to being proper and pure rest as described in the spec. So at least we're, they're moving in the direction of rest, if you will. I'll grant that. Now, Spring Boot is used to implement, to provide this. Well, Spring itself can be used to provide this. Spring Boot's going to add to that picture. So I can go and develop my controller classes. Now, the controller class, is the Java code that will actually respond to the requests that are described by a URI. So here, we have a request mapping, and when a request comes into the Spring container for slash customers, Spring's runtime will recognize that and say, aha, that needs to be mapped to some method on this customer API class, okay? Because I've described this as there's the request mapping and it is a REST controller. A controller in Spring annotations is something that it works with a mapping and receives those requests. It is called by the container, okay? now. How does that happen? So one of the things that will happen in Spring Boot, there's a default behavior in Spring Boot. I can actually reuse the same roughly dozen lines of code to create the main application, if you will, for hundreds and thousands of Spring applications because it really isn't anything there. It just basically says, hi, I'm here, run. So how do I make it my application? Well, that application, let's, you know, my, my dozen lines of, hi, I'm the main app, go into a package, app. And I'll put that little class in that package. Now, the default behavior for Spring Boot will be to search. So at startup time, Spring Boot's code will search all of the sub packages underneath where I put this little driver program and find all of these annotated controllers. And from that, it will build up its own internal routing table to know what requests it handles and which code handles which requests. So literally, I could copy the same dot .class file, forget even source code. I could, I could, I, you know, I, I could copy things into, and, and you know, as, and it will literally search underneath that, sub, that, that tree, finding all of the annotated classes. So that is one powerful aspect here of Spring Boot to implement REST-based behaviors. It's, we start by leveraging Spring MVC. Now, when we get to Spring Boot 2.0, I'll tell you about a, a new thing that can be used in lieu of Spring MVC. Um, but just starting off, you know, just starting off here with Spring Boot 1X, I've got my annotated controllers in Spring MVC, and they will be automatically discovered. I don't have to write the code to set all that up. 
there's no code to set it up. I create a controller class. I create my driver, my you know my my entry point. Entry point goes in a, 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 a high level package. My controllers go in sub packages underneath it, and they are automatically brought together and linked up. Magic. Okay. Now, this is still Spring. So my controller class wanted a service. It simply declares that as a dependency. And so while Spring has been doing its job of discovering the controllers, it also then, you know, discovers for each controller what its dependencies are. And for those dependencies, what those dependencies are. And so Spring will build up internally, automatically, a big graph and link all the dependencies together. So my controller class will be linked to a service. My service can be linked to um, a persistence layer or, or, or a networking layer or other things all automatically. I just declare dependencies. Injection is done for me. Instantiation is done for me. Right? That's just a quick look. Right? And I've actually already gone into a little bit about Spring Boot, more of this automatic discovery. Because all we're doing so far is really talking a bit about Spring and Spring MVC. But that whole thing about the auto discovery, while it can be done with Spring by itself, um, Spring Boot takes it again to the nth degree with convention. And so I don't even have to configure the automatic scanning. That's already done for me. Right? Spring, I could configure scanning. Spring Boot, I don't have to. It's already configured automatically. So couple of key concepts here, self-contained microservices, and this idea of being even more opinionated, in other words, even more automatic behavior than Spring itself. So microservices, and a little bit of snark, if you will. You've got to be fully buzzword compliant, so you're investing in microservices, but what are they? And there's a lot of good and somewhat disinformation about them. Fundamentally, microservices are simply services. Now, the microservices community, people who consider themselves different from other services approach, will tell you, oh, well, ours are narrowly focused. They're, 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 they're single purpose services. Well, that's nice, and I agree with all that. However, Having been a member of the Object Management Group's CORBA task force and designed a lot of the stuff that went into CORBA, and having been the, 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 the one time or I guess ex chairperson of the Common Object Services Task Force, I will assert to you that conflated services have always been an anti pattern. Now, I won't deny that there are a lot of stuff I, I see out there in the service oriented architecture space are conflated services that one service exposes a whole bunch of behaviors, but that's always been an anti-pattern. Just because people are doing it doesn't make it right. Roy Fielding made a comment related to REST and CGI scripts that, you know, <laughs> just CGI scripts almost by definition are wrong. You know, if, he, if we thought they were a good idea, we wouldn't have stuck them behind a gateway. So, yes, microservices are, in fact, properly designed, narrowly focused, single-purpose, monopurpose services. Literally, the service does nothing but logging. This service, I've seen it, you know, it'll go to the point where this service is a file access service. Right? This is the customer information service. It does nothing but one thing. Now, when you do this, you actually even go a little bit further. We're well, not going to go too far down this path, but I mentioned a customer information service. 
The fact is I may have a customer information database or set of databases. If I go as far as, for example, um, I, and I don't know how far they've gotten this in the implementation, though I'm hoping to find out next time I get a chance to work with them, but I worked with some of the architects at Federal Express a couple of years ago, and their goal was to no longer make available access to a database to any client application. In order for a client business application to get access to the information in a database, it was going to be forced to go through the service layer. There are a lot of reasons for that, including better support for schema evolution, security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but that's the point. So information services, or as IBM likes to refer to it, information as a service. Now, this does not require us to be spring boot, right? Helps because of the additional code, but the next thing, and the reason it's in bold, self-contained distributables. That's a key concept in the microservices world. When I develop my service, I don't want to have to go and find a computer and then install all sorts of things. I mean, a operating system, okay. But I don't want to have to install WebLogic or Red Hat JBoss or web sphere or or whatever and i don't want to have to worry about what libraries and it might be needed and where they go and all this other no 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 i'm going to want to have a single package one file i take that one file to that host operating system and i tell it to run and that's all i want to have to do for a deployment it is a self-contained distributable now, from this perspective, microservices are more of a DevOps concept than something for developers to worry about. Uh, although, as a developer, you probably will be responsible for packaging. Fortunately, in the Spring Boot world, packaging can be done automatically for you in our build environment. But this is the very cool thing about microservices. In a Spring Boot microservice can be, I mean, there are two different ways, but the way we want to do it, it's going to come out as a jar file, one jar. Copy the jar to any host system that has an operating system and Java, because Java is the one thing not packaged in there, and you can launch it. Tomcat, by default, you're, you have other choices. Tomcat is already packaged and configured in the jar. Your application is in the jar. Every jar file, so every library that you rely on, including Spring itself, everything is in that jar. So micro clearly does not refer to the size on disk because that jar file could be 48 meg. But one copy, I can deploy it with various cloud technologies, launch it, and it spins up in a matter of seconds. So it's going to be very scalable as well. So that's the whole key concept here. Self-contained distributables. Everything except for the operating system and the Java runtime. Everything, your code, configuration files, libraries, Tomcat. Everything, no installation necessary. Now that's cool. That is probably on anybody's top five list of features of Spring Boot. I don't know that I would have much trouble arguing the case of uh, this being a somewhat universally agreed to top feature of Spring Boot. Now, auto configuration or convention over configuration. Configuration is still necessary, at least internally. The point is that Spring Boot, through the use of starter modules, will implement code that does the configuration for you based on various conventions. 
So they will establish default settings. They will establish the wiring. I mean, I've already told you, um, it will scan the packages, all the packages, underneath my starting point for the application. So that convention is already there automatically. If I wanted to have things in some other tree, it's not that I can't, but I'll, I'll have to take some extra steps to make sure those things are scanned as well. But if I keep everything in, in a package tree underneath my starting point, everything will have been automatically scanned and set up. Okay. So again, default settings. Um, what do I mean by default wiring? Well, I have a database in my environment. It literally finds the presence of one of the supported databases. You've got that driver. You've got configuration for it in a properties file. I will automatically create, says Spring Boot, I will automatically create the data source. You didn't even configure it. I created the data source. Not only will I create that data source, but I will now inject it into anything that's dependent on it. So I have automatically created the data source and injected it. So I've created the, the objects and injected them. It'll go even further, as I will show you. There are some cases where I simply declare an interface, no code. Right, no implementation, nothing more than an interface. And from the interface, Spring Boot will actually create the objects that implement it based on conventions. Now, how cool is that? Okay, so settings, wiring, detection of these annotated classes, processing of them, generation of objects, proxies, and other things. Many, many things that Spring will automatically do for you. Well, Spring Boot. And that includes some of these additional technologies that we're going to be looking at coming up. Um, you know, all these different kinds of starter modules, whether it's data, Spring, data, you know, Spring Boot Data Rest, or the support for something like Fane and Ribbon, which we will talk about a little bit more explicitly, these things can all be done for you. And it's the, the basic code is what's in a starter module. So quick example, Spring Data Rest. Whoop, sorry, I uh, went one, the slide took over. There we go. Hey, there it is. Spring will notice that I have an embedded data source. Spring will automatically create the data source, but let me go quickly pull up. I think I've got an example loaded up in a browser. Now I'll use this example from Spring. Here we just have an entity annotated as JPA because they're going to use JPA in this example. More to the point, here is the interface. A person repository extends the paging and sorting repository and also has a find by last name. Now, could have more things. Find by last name and zip code. It would actually automatically generate the queries based on the words I used here. Okay, 
a paging and sorting repository is a CRUD repository that adds some paging support. So these methods are already on the interface, okay? These methods are already on the interface. Get account, whoop. Get account, delete an entity or delete everything, delete a list of entities, delete by ID, find if it exists, find all, find all by ID, or find one by ID, save it, so persist it. So here are my CRUD operations. Remember, it's create, retrieve, update, delete. Now this is an interface. There is no implementation here. This is strictly an interface. And so in addition to the basic save, finds, and deletes, in addition to those, we added, oh, sorry, wrong slide, wrong window. We added find by last name, referring to data in actually one of the columns. There'll be a last name column. Okay, Spring Boot, or specifically the Spring Data Rest starter for Spring Boot, will have actually generated the implementation for you. Not only has it generated the implementation, it's generated the data source and wired them together. So all I have to do in my service is if I had a separate service is declare a dependency on the repository, the data source will be created. So the driver's set up, the data source is set up, it's all loaded, it's connected. The CRUD repository with my extensions is implemented without my writing a single line of code. That's injected with the data source and then I can be injected with that. But wait, there's still more. It's like selling Ginsu knives. Um, how's this for cool? Spring data rest. Not only has it created the code to implement the CRUD operations, including my extended retrieve operations, but it has also created a REST controller that will be front-ending this. So not only can I write my own REST interface that calls the repository, but the repository itself can be automatically exposed via a generated REST endpoint. I don't even have to write the code for that. Okay? So, literally, if I wanted to connect an Angular application to a MySQL database through Spring Boot, on the Spring Boot side, all I would have to do is a starter um, for, you know, for my little, my, you know, my, my little main, which is the same stock lines of code that basically say Spring application, you know, Boot application run. So one line of code inside of a class. So other than that, I'd have that one line of code. I'd have my interface with the appropriate annotation. And I'd have my build config so that it knows about the driver. And I really don't have to write any more code because a REST interface will have been generated for me that my Angular application can now talk to. Done. Try that one on. I didn't actually write any code other than a couple of lines to start the app running and declared an interface. Spring Boot, being opinionated about how these things should work, has actually gone ahead and created all the code for me. As long as I follow the convention, for example, find by last name, find by manager, it'll you know go find all the ones for who, that have that manager that value in the manager column. I declare the interface, they will implement the code. That's part of what we're talking about here. Okay, 
Externalized configuration. We've got 15 minutes or so. So externalized configuration. As of Spring Boot 2.0, there are as many as 17 different places, and I am not going to go into all of them. They are well defined in the docs, where you could define configuration information. I'm only going to look at three of them, two right now and the third one coming up later. Okay. Um, one, I can have configure. Now, why would I care? Why do I need to externalize it? Well, remember, we just talked about how Spring is going to be opinionated and generate code and automatically set up the data sources, etc. Well, it might need to know where that data source should be set up to. And what I, the developer, ha might have set up for where my test server is and what you need in integration test, in QA, in staging, in production, might all be different setups. Po you know, maybe a couple of them use the same, you know, same database, but with different credentials. But whatever reason, they're going to have different setups. I don't want to have to repackage that one jar file as it moves through the environments. So I take the one jar file that worked for me on my desktop, and I send it over to other environments. And it's at that point that this becomes interesting. There's a well-defined place, for example, one of the 17, where I can place application property files in JSON or YAML format, or rather in properties format or YAML format, that will then be read by Spring Boot and will override the information that I might have left in there as a developer. So by, by, by storing the configuration information outside the jar in well-known locations, which, by the way, could have been NFS, um, as the jar moves through environments, it can be configured for that environment without having to go in and repackage the jar. As an alternative, I could actually even go with source with code. I, if I needed a, some bespoke weird thing, I could actually have code that would help out that my code would go load up and return dynamic values for the settings. Turns out there's an even better way to do this. If we're talking about the need for this, and, you know, we might also be talking about the fact that we want to go into our own cloud or a public cloud, whatever. We're deploying into a network topology known as a cloud. So there is something called Spring Cloud Config. It's part of the Spring Boot suite of technologies. Okay. So I set up a configuration server. That server can, re, can, can basically read configuration out of a Git repository. I now configure with a simple annotation to tell Spring Boot for my application to load the configuration from the cloud config server. So I set up my cloud config server. I set up my application to load from the cloud config server. I configure the cloud config server to read from Git. Now you can check out the configuration, modify it, check it back into Git. It will be reflected into the applications that depend on that running in the inner, you know, running in the cloud. And you've also got source code control. Right, You're, you, you've got revision management of your configuration. You can see when it changed, what changed, who changed it, the evolution of the changes, all of it. So the configuration is now being loaded over the network from a Git repository via a cloud config server. Very cool. Okay, that brings us to the cloud. So there, you know, Netflix is largely 
should get the credit for this stuff. Netflix, huge user and contributor of this technology. So they can fit, contributed a service registry called Eureka, a service client called Fane, a load balancer that works with Fane called Ribbon, A, well, we'll talk a little bit about the circuit breaker idea, but a circuit breaker that can work with Ribbon and Fane called Hystrix, and a gateway product called Zool. Yes, it is, in fact, a reference to Ghostbusters. So Eureka is a service registry for Spring Cloud. Oh, I have a question show up. Sorry. Uh, where's the question? Oh, nope, there are no questions. All right, it looked like there was. Okay, so Eureka splits up. We've got servers and clients. Now, when I say server, I don't mean a service for my application. I mean a, a registry server. That's its, that's its sole job is to provide the registry capabilities. And you can, in fact, have a little cluster of servers or, you know, a cloud of servers, if you will. So then I have Eureka clients. Now, Eureka clients are things that you talk to Eureka servers. Now, a Eureka client can provide a service. I am the inventory service. I am a Eureka client in that I will contact Eureka and publish my own existence. Hello, Eureka server. I am an instance of the inventory service. My endpoint is X. So as more and more people use the invoice or the inventory service, and as the inventory service perhaps needs more capacity and our cloud technology spins up more JVMs on more servers, they each register with Eureka and now Sir, Eureka clients that are service consumers contact the Eureka server and they say, hey, I need to know where are the endpoints for the inventory service. And they can now receive those endpoints and we can now load balance across those endpoints or at least find failovers, et cetera. So as, the, as demand increases, we can scale out the number of instances of a service. As the instance comes up, it will register with a registry, and clients can find out about dynamically about what the endpoints are that are available. So Eureka is the thing maintaining the registry and allowing me to publish and subscribe, if you will, to uh, endpoint information. Again, driven a lot by auto configuration and annotations. Now, Fane is, in a sense, a cousin of that data rest. Remember, I told you that Spring Data Rest is going to actually create the implementation of my service as well as create a REST endpoint for it. Well, here I have an interface for some service and Fane will automatically create the proxy. So I don't have to create the proxy, Fane will create it. I simply annotate the client's interface to it and Fane will generate the proxy. And so I, my business logic can be injected with a reference to that service interface which is actually the Fane generated proxy. Now I can tell Fane by hand where the endpoints are, or I can tell Fane to use Eureka and go look them up. Whoop, that's what I meant to do. That's what I meant to do. Now Ribbon works with Fane. Fane is responsible for the proxy, if you will. Ribbon provides the load balancing logic that Fane's proxy will then use. And there's a lot of different configuration we're not going to get into on Ribbon right now in terms of all the different ways in which Ribbon could handle load balancing. You know, is it round robin? Is it random? Is it somehow based on metrics? Whatever it is, 
We're not going to, you know, we're not going to get into that right now. Uh, we're not going to get into that today. Um, just letting you know those options are there, including the ability to customize. So Ribbon provides the load balancing logic that the Fane generated proxy will use. Cool. Zool. Microservices component people often you know, are very dismissive of the enterprise service bus pattern and, and service-oriented architecture in general that, that microservices are special in some way. Well, some of it, I think, is just wanting to have a to to to, to have a, to, to create a, a psychological break, even where technologically it's a bit of a fiction. Look, they say we've gotten away from the ESB, but they have a gateway. Well, what does the gateway do? Dynamic routing, message transformation, monitoring, and so. Um, yeah, there are some things that we do in microservices that are different from a typical service-oriented architecture, such as the use of a client-side load balancer ribbon rather than having the ESB do the load balancing for you. Yes, there are some things like that. It's because we've got improved technologies rather than you know having to do UDDI for J or something. So yes, improved technologies, we do some things in the microservices world a little bit differently than we have traditionally in, in, in SOA, things like, you know, ribbon. But we all still agree on this set of capabilities that we'd like to centralize. Whatever that centralized control was called, whether it was the ESB implementation or your gateway, Dynamic routing, message transformation, centralized monitoring, centralized security checking, and more. So Zool is a gatekeeper. Again, also part of the whole Netscape logic that will provide those, including the ability for you to write rules and extensions to, you know, to customize how the gateway works. Next up is Hystrix. We're back into the actual client, right? The same place that Fane and Ribbon run, Hystrix can go. So with Hystrix, it participates as part of that Fane generated client. And it looks to see what's happening with that proxy. What percentage, you know, how many calls fail? I'm making calls of the service and they're failing. What do I do now? Hystrix in its simplest form basically says I can provide a fallback implementation. If the service's calls are failing, do something else. And we can provide it, for example, with a fallback class. Now, there are other ways in which we can do this, but this is, in fact, probably the simplest way to use and describe Hystrix. Having seen a, a, a threshold crossed in terms of service failures, it will replace the proxy from calling the downstream to invoking the fallback implementation instead. Okay, a few more minutes to finish up. Spring Boot 2.0 has been recently released. A few things you should know. Minimum Java 8 and Tomcat 8.5. Spring Boot version 1 will not be supporting Java 9 and later. So at some point, you're going to Spring Boot 2.0. Out of the box, Spring Boot 2.0 will have a default security configuration. And maybe, and the one I'm highlighting here, the biggest change is the addition of support for reactive programming. In other words, Spring Boot 2.0 apps can be fully asynchronous and non-blocking, which means they will integrate better with technologies that also can do that, like Angular and MongoDB. So I, we can literally stream results from Mongo through Spring Boot 2.0 out to Angular and eventually to the display. 
all asynchronously. It's not like I have to wait for it in spring and return the collection. And so even though Angular was capable of handling a stream of results, I gave it a pseudo stream. Here was the chunk. Now parse it out. No, we can literally stream this stuff. So, and, and, and that includes, let's say I've got a large volume of responses and Angular is displayed enough. It can push back on Spring Boot 2.0, which can boot, push back on Mongo and suspend the stream. Full support for reactive programming. Integrates very well, for example, with Angular, for example, with the use of RxJS, Reactive JS in Angular. Um, very, it's a similar programming model to what you would see in, in, in you know, in RxJS environment. We use something called WebFlux. So, where do I have? Here we go. Something WebFlux, right? Spring Web MVC was based on servlet API and containers. The new model called Spring Web Flux starting in 5.0, non-blocking supports reactive streams. And I believe I have a sample for you here. Here's a REST controller using the same annotations. Here's my controller. I was dependent on that person repository. If they ask for a person, we're going to want to go ahead and get a person. Okay, to create. Sorry, this was a post of a person, rather. Here's a get mapping of a person. Now, this went to the person endpoint, so that's actually the list. So a flux is a stream of persons, whereas here we're asking for a single person by ID, and it returns a mono. A mono is similar to a flux, but it's only one of them, not a stream of them. All of that API, publisher, flux, and mono, come out of something called Project Reactor. Uh, right, comes out of this project. Okay, so that's where that API comes from. Okay, now we're almost on our time. We're actually on our time. So just letting you guys know, if this has been interesting to you, we do have a course coming up, a class coming up in a couple of, in a couple of weeks on May 14th. Um, so that's a virtual class, our, 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 our WA2607 workshop. If you can't make it in time for the June, May class, that is being offered again on June 18th. And if you want to know about other WebAge classes in this, you know, in all their spaces, I've, you know, here is a link to the public schedule of WebAge classes. Now, we are on, out of time, but I'm in no rush. So I'm here if you have questions. Otherwise, thank you very much for attending, and uh, and have a great weekend. Otherwise, um, feel free to un uh, you know to unmute yourself and talk. I'm gonna go see if anybody needs to be unmuted. You can use the text chat or the questions, whatever works for you.
see any questions. Yeah. Hello? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh thanks for this. Uh, can you can you go back to the um those uh those tools you introduced uh, like Eureka and uh, the oh yeah yeah Cloud Netflix. So this, this those those are frameworks uh, inside Spring, right? Well, they are they are available modules for Spring Boot. Um, oh, okay. If you if if you go look under uh, cloud. Dot spring. Dot io. Here's our Spring Cloud. And this is where you will find references to these various projects. Um, right, for example, here, service registry. Right, here's Eureka. Oh, okay. Um, Right. Um, here is the Hystrix dashboard, um, the config servers out here. They're all considered, you know, um, OAuth and and more. I mean, if I come look for, if I were to look for, um, you know, let's do a Google search here of Spring Fane. Right. Here's the, right, we're under the, Spring Cloud Netflix and right here under here's uh, the the open source implementations for Spring Cloud from Netflix specifically oh. Eureka Discovery uh, Circuit Breaker Fane Ribbon Spring Cloud Config, or here they've got something called Arceus. Uh, here's Zool. So, yep. So, which one is for the reactive support? Oh, re now reactive support. Oh, that was a different project. Reactive support was this. Um, Reactive support is built into Spring Boot 2 and Spring Framework 5 and comes from Project Reactor here. 
specifically this thing called reactive core. Okay. 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 Right. So reactive core, you know, works. One of the reasons why they require at least Java eight. Right. We deal with futures, streams, durations, the idea of fluxes and monos. Um, yeah. So yeah, you'd want to look at the documentation, for example, or go to the you go directly to the GitHub for Reactive Core, and here you'll find examples and implement and, and, and information. So yeah, all of that support came from uh, from the Reactive Project Reactor. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No worries. That's why we're here. Any other questions? Uh, if there are no other questions, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you.